Shuri. So I, on the agenda, if you have it, I have put down several links and just resources that we have available up on our you know, public website uh, that you know, faculty or anybody, parents, anybody can look at uh, in terms of knowing like what the crisis management team is, who they are, what kinds of things that we would be called upon to help, you know, uh, solve here on campus, everything from flooding to winter storms to COVID. Uh, so we have a crisis management guide that we kind of continually update uh, every year or two as things change and personnel changes on campus. And one thing as someone who oversees campus safety is I'm one thing I'm very grateful for is uh, is our location here in town being right across the street from the hospital. The fire department is you know only a block away essentially, uh, and then we have a great working relationship with the Goshen Police Department and Sean and Nick uh, and Jeremy and Matt and some of the others who've been on campus to help us out. And I know that whenever I've had them come to campus for anything or to investigate something that we see in campus safety that looks suspicious, uh, they're always like here pretty much lickety split split and helping us uh, evaluate the situation or the risk. So we're very grateful for all of these resources that we have. Um, the first thing I look, listed on there is the Omni Mobile App Alert, which would be important if we had some kind of campus emergency that we would utilize that rather quickly to get information to people on campus, whether that be students, uh, faculty or staff. Uh, there is a link to that website and I'm, I'm assuming that you all have been enrolled and you have that. and those alerts come in many different ways with OmniAlert as we're connected into everything from SMS, which so anybody who doesn't have the app would get those notifications. And then uh, lesser emergency things that we use the regular mobile app to send information as you get information about pandemic updates each week uh, that we send out to let people know that that stuff is available right away, uh, as well as links to the crisis management guide, which is kind of the consumer version on our website. Uh, for things of distinguishing emergency crisis, who the CMT members are, how we handle media uh, on campus. And then there's the annual campus safety and security report, which has a ton of information that we're kind of obligated to have and prepare uh, as a consumer report and also uh, just general information about safety uh, on campus in terms of crime reporting, uh, fire safety, like all these things we do, even things like the evacuation drills. Uh, yesterday all around campus are part of our efforts to educate and, and train. So uh, the other thing here, there is a link to the active shooter training video that we did a couple years ago in the uh, in the church. I went, think we had Matt Yoder from the camp from the uh, GPD who was out to uh, go through that. So there is audio there where you can get something that actually happened on campus as well for additional resources. Another thing is safe colleges. We have modules uh, for active shooter training on there that are kind of optional ones uh, for students and faculty to uh, do if you were logged into safe colleges if you're looking for additional information on here. Uh, in terms of a campus lockdown here, we would obviously work very closely with the Goshen Police Department and uh, I do get press releases and information pretty timely from there if there was some kind of active threat that did impact our campus to the point where we may have to do some sort of uh, preventative lockdown. Um, and in which case, uh, so I work with our building managers on campus. Some of you may be a building manager uh, and each kind of fall, I, I do a check-in uh, to make sure that they understand their role. And I kind of, uh, not necessarily when I think a building manager, it doesn't mean like a director of the building per se, but someone, a representative who knows where the emergency keys are and communicates those out, which they're basically hex keys for most of the buildings. Uh, where if we had to do a lockdown quickly, uh, we have people, representatives in each building who would be the ones to uh, facilitate that lockdown. Uh, and that would probably come through a form of an Omni alert or a text alert uh, directly to them to say, hey, we've got a lockdown instituted and here's it's, it's go time. Uh, so last time I did that was back in the fall, uh, early fall, I think actually last year. Uh, and then we update as people come and go, we do update uh, that with new people who come in. Uh, so that would be an important part of a lockdown. We also have ITS and the, the uh, access control readers. We have a way to quickly trigger those into a lock mode. Uh, if some of those are released at any point during the day, we can, we can trigger those electronically. Uh, so, and then some places like a church and the music center would be gathering places that we may send everybody if we had to do some sort of assembly uh, and determine like the next step if there had to be some kind of campus evacuation due to 
uh, a derailment or a chemical or gas leak where we couldn't be uh, here on the campus during the time which uh, we have students. So that's kind of just an overall breakdown in terms of like our campus response. And we would be very reliant on help with help from the Goshen PD telling us there was some direct impact on our campus. Uh, so a lot of people are like, what would we do? I go, well, we would do what the police and the authorities were telling us to do mostly. Uh, but we do have a team formulated, obviously, the crisis management team to help make those decisions. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy. Jeremy's going to got to give you a kind of a real world, like on a personal response. Like what would you do as an individual? Uh, should we have some form of breach or campus emergency uh, related to an active threat? So Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you. You can unmute and I'll let you go. And he has a PowerPoint. He's going to share his screen so you can follow along. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll get going here. I apologize up front. I don't have a polished PowerPoint presentation for this. This is actually some stuff that I pulled from uh, other presentations, namely from one that we will do for a chaplain's conference later on. But um, this stems from a, a talk that we did for the city council um, in regards to just a general awareness, personal awareness, uh, safety, um, and some of the things to consider, like how our brain works under stress, um, what some of our frame of references are, and uh, why, uh, depending on the frame of reference, it can it affect your personal safety one way or the other. And then also uh, understand some just real basic physical limitations on what we can and can't do. And then also well, just a touching on uh, predator mindset and why that's important. So um, one of the first things is all of us, uh, whether you live in a first world country, a third world country, but definitely primarily in a first world country, we are, our frame of re reference for most people is very, very heavily influenced by Hollywood. Um, and if you are fortunate enough to, uh, uh, and a large chunk of the population is, to not be involved in significant acts of violence or critical incidents, then lots of times that will be your only frame of reference when, um, uh, you're referencing, your brain is referencing. So I apologize for this recap, but uh, for most most people, especially if you um, were fortunate enough to live a, a lifestyle that doesn't involve a lot of direct contact or violent action, then Hollywood ends up being our only frame of reference for the brain. Um, when you're conscious and there's no stress, very, very easy to separate uh, fiction from reality. Once a enough of a stressful event takes place, uh, the forebrain, human forebrain starts to shut down, uh, midbrain starts taking over. And what happens is the brain hates a gap. It's going to try to, it's going to try to find some form of reference that fits the current situation. And if your only frame of reference from the past is what you've seen in movies or television, uh, that is what the brain is going to try to make fit the scene. So because there's a, such a difference between what we see in Hollywood movies and what it, the actualities of violent actions are, it causes a lot of people to freeze up. So uh, we'll just talk a little bit about some of those differences. And then just understanding a little bit about what some physical limitations, what people can physically uh, can and can't do and how fast they can do that. All right. Um, <clears throat> and then, like, like I said, we will touch just slightly on uh, some basic understanding some common traits among predators and why that's important for you. Um, so we talked about this marked difference between Hollywood and reality. There is definitely a marked difference between most of society, the vast majority of society, and those who have a predatory mindset. Uh, understand, not understanding that both of those truths can uh, obviously cause, can be fatal, especially if you don't realize that there's a difference. So there's a what we tell um, everybody, regardless of what your profession is, anytime we're talking about a survival uh, situation, whether it is uh, a direct correlation to a violent act or it can just it can be some, any any critical incident like a car accident, anything like that, uh, you're dealing with the limitations of the body, which is uh, we, it's dubbed P300, but it's the time it takes to sense a change in your environment and then start to react to that change, and there is. A limit to how fast that happens. Uh, regardless of your reflexes, regardless of your training, there's going to be a minimum gap of about three tenths of a second before you can see you have a, one of your five senses gives you a change in the environment and your brain can start to formulate a plan to deal with that change. 
there's no way to shorten that there is uh, other than anticipating the event. So that is um, a bare bones basic biological limit to how fast a person can react to something. Uh, we tell people all the time, uh, action is always, always, always faster than reaction, meaning that a slow person who acts first will always um, complete their action faster than a someone who is reacting to them. Um, when we are forced to make a decision and that, that time to make that decision is less than two seconds, give or take a couple fractions of a second, uh, we fall into what we call recognition prime decision making meaning that the conscious brain is too slow to go through that. It makes better decisions, but it's gonna to take too long to do it. So the brain automatically kicks in. Uh, the more primal for a very base term, but the primal part of the brain, the midbrain takes over. And it's going to, based upon what you're seeing, what you're recognizing from the actions, it's going to force you into conclusion. It's gonna take whatever past experience you have and try to make that fit the current circumstances. And that's whether you have any experience in that event or not. So when, we're, when we fall into that RPDM, that less than two seconds to formulate a plan, um, we fall into a four-stage decision-making process that we call the OODA loop. Um, that is observe, uh, that's, you observe what the change in the environment is, you orient yourself to that change, what do you have to do because of that change, you decide then what's gonna happen and then you act. Those four stages happen very, very quickly. They can, I should say. Every single person, regardless of your training and your background, is gonna go through all four of those stages. You can't skip a stage. Um, if, you've, if you're committing an action that you've done many, many, many times over and over and over again, and you're very familiar with that action, then some of those stages make it get compressed because you're very fluent with them, you're very familiar with them, but you will always go through all four stages. If you get interrupted anywhere in those four stages, it's gonna make your brain kick back to the beginning and you have to start over. So the reason that's important is if uh, we have, if there is a critical incident and we are trying to uh, get people to escape or trying to get people to survive or we're trying to get them into a position where they're better prepared to uh, exit or see an exit, if we can interrupt a uh, person's thought process that makes them start that thought process over and that gives people time. So frame of importance is pretty important and uh, that has to do our frame of reference, or sorry, frame of reference is important because we need to know about some of those human limitations, how fast something can happen. We need to know the fact that under stress, most of us are gonna revert back to what we believe Hollywood says about violence. So, uh, the brain is always trying to make sense of the world and it's always going to try, try and take past references that we've had, make that fit the current situation, whether we've had anything that fits the situation or not. So frame of reference is going to dictate your perception, how you're looking at an event, your perception, then how you perceive what's going on. That's going to heavily influence whether you, you fear, how much fear you have, or whether you don't have any at all. Um, your fear then will influence your physiology and that your physiology then definitely influences your response, your ability to respond to the situation at hand. The more you have a accurate perception of what's going on around you, the more that you can negate, neutralize, or control your fear. That allows you to control your physiological response, which is very important because that helps you to uh, think through a situation instead of just reverting under stress to reacting. So we talked about this briefly already, but without experience in violence, which thankfully the vast majority of our population does not have, your brain will draw from the only source it knows in a violent event, and that's going to be Hollywood again, something that you would never do consciously, but happens unconsciously under stress. Frame of reference is definitely critical for survival. We want everybody to have a a general understanding of, of how the, the body and the brain is gonna react under stress because that increases your chances for survival. It's very important to understand you can literally think yourself to death. Um, we had a situation uh, in Chicago um, a while back, but a uh, class that I was going through, uh, one of their trauma center doctors was talking about us, uh, talking us through a situation where they brought somebody in who thought they were shot um, they coded several times. They had to bring the person back several times. 
and it ended up being a situation where they actually hadn't been shot. There was no actual physical damage to that person, but their blood pressure had dropped, their heart rate had dropped. Uh, they were, the body was uh, their, I should say their physical appearance was exactly like um, that of somebody who had been, who had taken around and they never did. It was purely a matter of the, the person thinking that they had uh, been shot. So you, the, the mind definitely controls the body. Um, it's, you have to program yourself to survive, to understand that regardless of the circumstances, I'm going to pull through, I'm gonna help other people throw, pull through and we will get out of this. Uh, we stress with our guys, um, regardless who we're teaching, whether it's officers or uh, anybody outside the profession, that your body can't go where your brain hasn't been. Um, one of the biggest tragedies of, of, of tragic events, but active uh, shooter, active killer, uh, is what we call them because the the mode of the violence doesn't matter. It could be a knife, it could be a gun, it could be an explosive, it could be fire. But any active event where you have one or more people trying to cause trauma to one or more people ongoing is what we call an active killing event. And, um, one of the biggest tragedies nationwide of these events, uh, whether it's the nightclub down in Miami, um, whether it's in California or the school in Pennsylvania, is that most of our most of the people who end up becoming a casualty, it's not because people couldn't get out, but it's because the stress of the situation is so great and no one has ever pictured himself in that situation that they just freeze. They don't fight, they don't run, they don't move. They, they literally get, go into an almost catatonic state and stay there. Um, we've gotten this from survivors of the incident, from uh, witnesses that have been interviewed. And this, like I said, this is not just one area of the country, this is everywhere. Um, nobody wants to think about an incident like this and we hope that nobody ever happens to, but what we, what we have noticed is regardless of where these incidents happen, it doesn't matter if it's in California, it doesn't matter if it's in the little one room school in Pennsylvania, there has been nowhere in the country that we can find where somebody who gets interviewed after the event doesn't say, I can't believe it happened here. And that's, that's a defense mechanism of a sort for the human mind, uh, for most humans is we don't wanna think about stuff like this, right? It's uncomfortable. Um, if, if I don't think about the fact, or if I don't think that it's going to happen here, or it doesn't have the potential to happen here, then it's a, it's a non-issue for me. It's not a survival issue. And we don't want people to dwell on bad experiences. We also don't want people to be in a, a state of denial that it could happen here. Um, if you never thought about the possibility or what it might look like in the, your sphere of influence, like where you work, uh, like for you guys, it would obviously be the campus. If you've never even thought about the possibility of what you might do if, you, if a tragic event does happen or just any kind of critical incident does happen, it could be a fire, then your brain will, your brain has to try to work through something it's never worked through before. Uh, we, we stress with our guys all the time that it's much, much better for you to mentally think through scenarios and at least have an idea because that gives your brain some kind of reference to fall back to some kind of framework as opposed to just ignoring the possibility. Um, as far as when it comes to predator mindset, uh, behaviorally all over the world, people are fairly similar in that mo uh, most populations in most countries fall into what we call the 20-60-20 rule. 20% 20 of the population are gonna be good, what we call good guys, quote unquote, 60% are fence sitters and then 20% are what we call bad guys. And that is by and large holds fairly true across, across the globe. There's, you may have 20% of a population that may be bad actors, people who uh, aren't concerned with following the law or aren't concerned with other people other than themselves. But it's the, the 1% of that 20% of the true, the true people that are concerns, concerns for security and concerns for uh, campus safety and stuff like that. Um, from a, I've gone to several classes on predatory mindset. One was uh, from an officer who turned, uh, became a psychologist after he retired. Another class at that same conference was from a former convict who actually now trains law enforcement. 
and what they both said coming from completely different sides of the the um topic was for some of these people <clears throat> violence itself is the point um one of the biggest things or one of the the worst things you can do in a critical incident especially if it's a critical incident that involves violence is trying to uh try to apply your beliefs to their actions um, and this, and that lots of times this will not be something that somebody consciously does, but again, our brain doesn't like stuff that doesn't make sense. So it's constantly trying to make sense of what's going on around us, even if that event is tragic. And so sometimes people, part of the free people, reason people freeze or lock up has to do with the fact that they're so, uh, consciously or subconsciously trying to figure out, make sense of this tragic event that's going on around them. And all that will do at that point is going, again, slow you down, slow your ability to help yourself and others. Uh, your beliefs will not fit a true predator's actions and trying to make that work or make sense of why they're doing what they're doing gives you no benefit as far as from a survival standpoint or those around you. Uh, people get targeted all the time. That doesn't mean that people become victims all the time. It just means that those with the predatory mindset are always looking at stuff in terms of cost versus benefit. And so it's just something to be aware of. Again, we're, <clears throat> we do the same thing with our officers. We're not, we don't want people to be paranoid. We want people to be prepared. There's a difference between the two. Preparation is understanding that bad events can sometimes happen. And so having a general idea of what I would do if, if in a bad event does being paranoid is assuming that every person you meet is going to be the next bad actor that's going to try to bring violence to you or someone else. Uh, <clears throat> both, both classes that I went to on predatory mindset, both of the instructors talked about the fact that uh, predator's eyes are narrowly focused, but they see very, very deep um, what they decide to look at when it comes to cost versus benefit, what they're, um, what they're, the reason that they are there um, they pay very, very close attention to. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, if you um, body language that that may leak. So uh, again, not to cause any kind of paranoia, but just to give you guys a, a broader view of this, aggravated assaults uh, continue to go up across the US. The what constitutes an aggravated assault may change. So you may see criminal statistics go down or up based on how crimes are logged. But the, uh, the fact of the matter is that assaults in general, especially those that are aggravated, they just continue to rise. Um, the average term now in the US served for homicide is only a handful of years, uh, which most people don't realize that. Um, by 21 years of age now, your average American under normal consumption has seen over 250,000 types of violent death in some form of media or another. And that's for the average person. Um, for a lot, that average obviously continues to rise, uh, rise as media consumption continues to go up. Now, again, if you have a, uh, a person who's um, like a 21 year old who's conscious right not under stress he, he can easily say yeah i've seen this but i've watched this i obviously know that's fake that's not real uh but again under stress mid-brain control no um no practical concept other than what you've seen people will tend to revert back to what they've seen in media so a couple things one of the biggest things to counter this right is so we talked a little bit about predator mindset we talked a little bit about the fact that okay so there's limitations to what we can and can't do so how do we keep ourselves safe or what should we be aware of and the single biggest factor for anybody's personal safety regardless of your training regardless of where you're at regardless of what you do for a living is just what we call situational awareness just being aware of what's going on around you as a whole um, human beings are not very good at paying attention to stuff other than themselves or what's in their immediate vicinity. Uh, in America, it's even worse. The more media consumption we have, um, especially now with smartphones, the more people are kind of buried into what's going on directly in front of them on their phone or what's, um, what's in front of their eyes literally right at that moment. Be aware of surroundings, <clears throat> right? We tell guys all the time, the the best fight is the one you never get into, right? The, the situation that you see coming before it happens. 
So we'll talk quickly about, we tell people, you know, use Cooper's color code, which I'll sh show that to you here in a second to observe other stress. So we're gonna show you some levels of stress. Um, and then we'll talk about the fact that what's really important for everybody is to be observant of those around you. If you see someone else who's obviously extremely stressed, could be from obviously various different reasons, but um, we talk about you're looking for stuff that doesn't fit, doesn't, and we're looking for what we call clusters of three. Like if you see three different things that don't fit, then there may be cause for concern. Like someone wearing a long baggy coat, heavy winter coat, and it's the middle of summer uh, or vice versa. So Cooper's color code is, if you're observing other people, someone who, uh, like what we call code white is just someone who's unprepared, unready to take action. That's somebody who's really, really relaxed and has no concerns. So like you're sitting in a restaurant, you see somebody sitting across from you, that person's on their phone, they're kicked back, they're relaxed, their body language is, is loose. Um, they're not concerned about looking around them. That's someone who's relaxed. That's what we would call code white. Yellow is someone who's prepared. Um, they're alert and relaxed, but they have good situation, situational awareness. So yellow would be somebody who is paying attention to what's going on around them. They're not tense. They're not clenching their hands. They don't look upset. They don't look angry, but they are paying attention to their surroundings. Or I'm just somebody who's alert to probable danger and they're ready to take action. That is somebody who is starting to tense up. They're paying attention to their surroundings and they're really, really focused on what they think might be a danger. Uh, red then is somebody who's actually taking action. Black is when we teach this class, that's what we want every, everybody to avoid. That's what we want you guys to avoid. Code black is when uh, you've been stressed to the point where you're no longer using your forebrain at all. So none of your conscious decision making is going on. Uh, the midbrain is taken over completely and your body is turned into survival mode. Your brain is pulling all of your blood black from your extremities. Your fingers and toes start getting um, tingly because the brain is taking all of the oxygen and the blood and bringing it into the center of your body to your heart your lungs uh, your brain is preparing you to f flee <clears throat> and what happens is when somebody gets to that point mentally um, they're not making any kind of conscious decision they're just reacting their brain's just reacting to the environment so people don't think well and uh, they may freeze they may run they may run into a wall they may fall down not be able to get back up because they're um, they're just not operating at the level of a normal conscious adult. So for you guys, if you are seeing somebody who's very, very tense, like you may be, if you're in a meeting or uh, let's say you're, you have an event that uh, for one reason or another is open to the public and you see everybody's relaxed this event, everybody's having a good time, people are conversing, uh, they're having, um, oh, you know, eating, drinking, and then you see this one person who is the exact opposite of that. They're tensed up. They're in a corner. They're watching everybody. Um, you can see them clenching and unclenching their hands. They're dressed inappropriately for, uh, compared to everybody else. They're either dressed for the winter and it's summer or vice versa. When you start seeing someone like that, you see, okay, the norm is, the norm is what the rest of the crowd is. The norm is people are relaxed. People are having a good time. You see this, a person like that, that's not normal. It's not the norm for the environment. Now, it could just be that person is stressed out, they're having a bad day, um, but it could be something else. It's something where you may not take any action at that point, but you're just aware of the fact that, okay, this person over here is very, very tense. They're having an issue. Um, again, I don't want, we don't want people paranoid, but want you to be aware that of the fact that that person is, for whatever reason, is not falling into what the norm for this group is. Um, so seeing changes in people's uh, body language and their behavior and how they're holding themselves and how they're talking to other people, all of those could be pre-indicators for you to see a problem before it becomes a, a bigger problem. So uh, pay attention to people, especially when your areas we tell everybody should have a general idea, right? When you guys go to your, whether it's your offices or it's an event at the church, at the chapel or the music center or anything like that, or uh, in one of the dorms, when you walk into the building, it's not a bad practice to just have a general idea of where your closest exit is. If something happens and you need to get out of that building, it's good to know before the event happens, well, this is the fastest way to get out for me. 
Um, it's not a bad idea to have a know where your ex, a second exit is besides that. So if for some reason you can't go out the closest exit, you know where else you're gonna go. Because again, that stuff sounds very, very basic, very simple, but under stress, we have a tendency to to not think at all like we normally, uh, well, we, not tendency, we won't think at all. We won't be thinking consciously like we would do when we're not stressed. So just pay attention to your environment, pay attention to your exits, watch for other people watching you outside the norm. It's normal for people to glance at each other, especially in America. It's not so much normal for someone to lock onto somebody and hold that gaze for an extended period of time, especially when it's, when it's intense. Um, so <clears throat> watch for someone trying to take an angle on you. And by angle, we mean somebody who's trying to work around so they can get to your back. Someone who you may be facing and they're obviously trying to uh, get to somewhere where you can't see them. Uh, any potential attempt or any attempt to put, uh, mass behavior could potentially be a threat. Again, by itself, it may mean nothing, but if you have somebody who, again, socially doesn't fit the scene, they're out of the norm, they're tense when everybody else is relaxed, they're intently watching you for an extended period of time, they see that you can see them, so they try to move to a position that you can't see them, um, they're obviously masking behavior. And if uh, masking behavior, can be a sign that something's going to happen or potentially something's going to happen. Um, and we tell guys, it, it doesn't matter where you are. It could be your church. It could be anytime you're out in public, you should have a general awareness of what's going on around you. And again, that's, that's not being paranoid. That's not thinking that there's a threat behind every uh, bush or every tree. It's just being aware of your surroundings, paying attention to the fact that you know, there was 30 people on this street 10, uh, you know, five minutes ago, and I'm walking, the sun's starting to go down, and I'm, I'm the only one on here. You know, what happened to everybody else? Why did everybody else leave? Uh, people, um, other people, our subconscious mind is much, much better at detecting danger than our conscious mind. Um, you hear the stories fairly frequently, especially in, our line, especially in our line of work, where someone says, you know, I was walking up, everything things seem normal and suddenly the hairs in the back of my neck stood up um that's you know people who you may some people call it your sixth sense uh call it what you will but our um all of our senses working together actually catches danger the subconscious catches danger much much quicker than the conscious it's just that in today's society um we have tamped that down because we don't live uh in a survival environment like we used to So that was very, very quickly running through uh, a fairly large amount of detail in a short period of time. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those right now.